name is Nick Middleton. I live in Middle England in the mid latitudes. I'm middle-aged, earning a middling salary writing travel books and teaching geography at Oxford University. My life is extremely comfortable, or at least it was, till one mild summer's day when I was thinking about the English obsession with weather. I had an idea for a book. We complain ceaselessly about our temperate climate. But what must it be like to live with real extremes? What was life like in the hottest, coldest, wettest and driest inhabited places on Earth? I put this question to my publisher, and to my horror, she said go and find out. Siberia. Translated, it means sleeping land. 13 million square kilometers of it, almost 80% of the landmass of Russia. I had images of Dr. Shivago in the Gulag Archipelago. Featureless Arctic tundra and vast coniferous forests, punctuated only by the remnants of labor camps, a dumping ground for forgotten human souls. But I was to discover that this was only half the picture. In the heart of this gigantic wilderness lies Oymyakon, the coldest permanently inhabited place on Earth and my ultimate destination. But I slipped into Siberia two and a half thousand kilometers to the southwest for a gentle introduction. Out in the air for less than a minute. Already I can feel my hairs and my nose freezing. The temperature in Irkutsk was minus 38 degrees Celsius, the cruelest winter in living memory. Apparently the hospitals here had run out of anaesthetic because they'd had to amputate so many frostbitten limbs. But it was still more than 30 degrees warmer than the record Oymyakon claims of minus 71.2. Having booked into my hotel, I decided that I'd better go and acclimatize to the cold, because tomorrow I had a real baptism into life below zero. As my translator, Dima, drove me to my rendezvous in the morning, I was secretly hoping that the current cold snap might just get me off the hook. I think 42, 34. 32, 34, minus, minus. minus. <laughs> and are you going swimming? Me? Yes. No. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> You're not crazy. All oh, right, OK. <laughs> but even in the minus 30s, the Akutsk Walrus Club were not downhearted. This Sunday, like every other Sunday, brothers Sergei and Victor were breaking the 50 centimetre thick ice on the river Kitoy, preparing for a dip. I had rather mixed feelings about the whole concept, but according to Natasha, daughter of the Warriors Club secretary, this wasn't just masochism Siberian style. Why do people come together in these walrus clubs? Because it's firstly it's good for health. It's good for your health. Yes, the organism becomes uh, resistible to any cold. Okay, so if you do this regularly, you become healthy. Yes, of course, <clears throat> and for for good spirit. Also for good spirit. Good spirit. Yes. Uh, better than vodka in that case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha's claim that the dip was good for your health reminded me of Captain Bowers. He was the only member of Scott's last Antarctic expedition who doused himself in ice water every morning. He was also the only member, while alive, never to suffer from frostbite. 
if you uh, if you do everything rightly, your your body should be warm. Right. Gets warmer. Warmer in than out. If it hadn't been for the women and kids doing it, I'd have wimped out. Despite Sergei and Victor's relentless pressure for me to get my kit off. Faster, faster, faster. 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 Maybe it was just the nerves, but at minus 32, the ritual salute to the sun didn't do much to console me. It was only after the death that things started going wrong. Skin feels like it's someone else's. It's not really my skin, man. I think I must have been in shock because by the time I got round to recording my diary that evening, I couldn't even stand. Good for your health. Well, maybe. I can't say it feels good for my health at the moment because I just feel as if I'm in a state of shock. And I do sort of just about recall coming out. But then it sort of went blank completely. Well, I certainly feel as if I've arrived. I mean, it was the perfect way to start. A little hole in the ice to go swimming in. People in Wild well, okay, it doesn't get down to minus 35 in Britain, but, you know, minus 5 and people wrap up and don't dare to step outside. And yet all these Siberians were out there having a good time. It was great. The shashliks came out and the vodka and... Just, I really do feel as if I'm here now. And yes, the cold hurts, but um, there are very positive sides to being minus 35 degrees centigrade. And a war club is one of them. Have a dip, get around the fire and have a party. The next day I flew north. The sense of penetrating deeper into the heart of Siberia was palpable. I was eight hours ahead of London, on the same longitude as Australia. I felt as if I'd entered another dimension. Flying into Yakutsk was like landing on a different planet. On the ground, the building showed just how cold it was. The earth here is frozen solid to great depths year round. Heat from the kitchen of a house built directly onto this permafrost can partially thaw the surface layers which then subside, leading to whole streets with neither a vertical nor a horizontal line in sight. The modern solution is to maintain the permafrost by building everything on stilts. Apartment buildings and their service pipes stand on tiptoe as if apologetic for intruding upon this frozen land. Unfortunately, I wasn't so insulated. I needed some kit, and the best place to buy local clothing, according to my guide, Andre, was the central market. Needless to say, it was outdoors. It's, it's minus 38, Andre. Who are these people? Those coats probably won't be warm enough for me, will they? Of course, they won't be out for ladies. <laughs> and for ladies, yeah. Okay. Oymyakon's coldest recorded temperature is at least 30 degrees colder than Yakutsk was. If I was to survive, Andre insisted that I go native, starting with my head. Uh, this is a mink one. Mm -hmm. I've heard that mink is best. 
One of the best. Sable is better. The same material. Yeah. Yeah. Long enough laps. Uh, yeah. Maybe not long enough. Wow. Yeah. That feels very sexy. Yeah. I think it's better. Yeah. It's kind of more reliable hat. With a reliable hat made from raccoon fur, we turn to footwear. Synthetic fabrics don't cut much ice here, and Andre advised reindeer skin boots. Feels quite good. With felt old boots and huge hat in the bag, the final item was a sheepskin coat, made from about ten dead sheep if weight was anything to go by. I was ready for the off, and we were planning to leave at seven the next morning. Siberian roads being what they are, frozen rivers are often the smoothest route. And my journey started with the crossing of the mighty Liena. Frozen here for seven months of the year and 19 kilometers wide, this river, lost in the center of Siberia, is one of the 10 longest in the world. It was over 700 frozen kilometers from Yakutsk to Ornikon, and if your engine and therefore your heating failed in those temperatures, that would be it. So it was thought best to have two vehicles. I understand mosquitoes are a serious problem yeah. in the summer. And closer to autumn, there are a lot of midge. Midges as yeah, well. Midges as well. So plagues of locusts, mosquito swarms, then the midges, serious sub-zero temperatures during the winter. Tough place for tough people. And I've come at the toughest time. Yeah, toughest time in the middle of winter. Yeah. We'll see if I survive. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll check. Yeah, check. Check regularly, please, Andre. <laughs> After a brief overnight stay in a trucking stop, the Verkoyansk Mountains loomed up ahead of us. The approaches to these mountains are riddled with a strange sight for minus 40 degrees, running water flowing from thermal springs. The trees about the spot where the road crossed one of these springs were covered with bits of material as offerings to the spirits. One of our fixers, Anatoly, insisted that we stop and make an offering to protect us through the mountains. So the spirit of this location and spirit of this water will help us. Good. Our will be okay. Excellent. Good luck. Good luck. We've paid our respects. Seventy years of communist atheism hadn't stopped a healthy level of pagan superstition surviving in Siberia, perhaps because life is so precarious here. Indeed, the road we were traveling was built on death. Known in polite circles as the Kolyma Road, the Russians have also dubbed it the road built on bones because it was constructed by inmates of Stalin's gulags who froze to death and couldn't be buried in the permafrost, so their skeletons were used as ballast for the road. The road stretches 1,400 kilometers inland from the eastern coast and, worryingly for me, it said that the first people to die when it was being built were always the Western Baltic peoples. The reason it was